The family farm, a tradition in Canada going back 200 years. This canola farm has been in the family for three generations. Today's farmers face the same challenges as their forefathers. Weather, soil fertility, pests, commodity prices. But today's farm is radically different from the romantic ideal. Today's farm is a vast and complex enterprise employing cutting edge technology. From breakthroughs in genetics, communications, and chemistry, we grow our food more quickly with less energy, less environmental impact, and in greater abundance than ever before. In fact, no society in history has enjoyed the variety and abundance of food that Canadians now have. But farmers face a new challenge. Consumers and activist groups have called into question. Has technology made our food different? Is our food safe? Farming, as many people will automatically quickly say, is a very risky business. Weather is your biggest risk. Uh, markets are there too, and they're related to weather in different parts of the world. But uh, now we have a more significant risk, it seems like, is that we uh, uh, there's a, a pushback from the public, from our customers, the, the, the consumer who uh, thinks that we're not doing things in a, in a proper way. We as producers, rely on the consumer as our as our customer and we want to produce the best healthiest product we can public fears about food safety are putting pressure on government and decision makers to restrict the approval of gm foods like the oil from the canola grown here and to ban the use of certain pesticides Canada's food certification process is already one of the strictest in the world. But will it become so restrictive that farmers will lose their choice about how they manage their crops? Canadian farmers have never before faced a challenge of this magnitude. I've tried to pay attention to what's happening in Europe and other parts of the world and I've seen where farmers are more legislated, there's more regulation that is coming down, there's a lot of misinformation and, and that worries me. And so farmers are really facing uh, questions about how they produce food because it's such a, an important part of every family. How is it that this food comes to be on my plate and is it safe? The vast majority of the population is so far removed from agriculture that for the first time ever there's a huge disconnect. Their conceptions are still stuck in the 1940s, 1950s, they're still stuck in the mom and pop really small farm and a lot of things have changed since then. These days when there's so much controversy about many nutritional issues and many farming issues, uh, people are confused, they're bewildered, they don't know who to listen to. They're researching those aspects of agriculture, but what they're finding isn't always true, isn't always scientific, and for the most part is not directly from the source. There is money in the anti-farm movement. Someone's making money off it. They're selling an alternative, and farmers are paying the price. A lot of the activists, you know, who, who promote what I consider are illegitimate fears about our, our food, do it very well. You have to give them begrudging respect for their activism. Uh, they come out with very romanticized arguments, not scientifically based, but very, very compelling. If farmers don't rise to the occasion and start telling their own stories and proactively sharing information about their farms, about their production practices, about their values, farmers are going to see increased legislations that aren't coming from a place of agronomy, they're not coming from a place of agriculture, they're going to be coming from politics. Farmers like my dad will be forced to change how they grow food. In Europe would be a perfect example. They don't have the option to grow genetically modified seeds what kinds of uh, regulations are going to be put into effect. You know, the automakers have more influence than farmers do. So it's really important that we are able to explain to people what it is that we're doing and, and let them know this, just how safe their food is. Uh, I'm a city girl and uh, married a farmer and we've been married for 20, 29 years and uh, it's been a steady learning curve for me, learning what farming is all about. Um, I think I've had questions uh, about the safety of chemicals and how important it is to, to learn uh, about those things and that 
uh, some of the things that are coming up on social media are not really based on science and they really have no, have no basis in fact. And that we, we just need to keep uh, looking for answers. In Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, growers from all over Western Canada have gathered for CropSphere. This year, one of the topics is about how farmers can talk to the public about food safety and explore three areas of public concern genetically modified foods, agriculture's use of chemicals, and the idea that the small farm of yesteryear is gone, and food production has been taken over by megacorporations. They hope that farmers will be able to speak directly to the public about their farming practices, explain why they use certain technologies, and reassure the public that their food is safe. And I believe the media wants to hear from farmers. Okay, and I need a story that actually resonates with the consumer. Farmers can make uh, these choices on their farm right now. If these conversations don't happen, it's not necessarily going to always be the farmer's choice of how they operate. I would never intentionally buy a GMO. I avoid them at all costs. If I bought one, it's by accident. I think there are just too many things going on in the world today with bees and butterflies and birds and crop failures things that just aren't natural, and I think we need to do things as naturally as we possibly can if we're going to let the world survive. The first concern is that genetically modified foods are substantially different from the varieties that we have always had in our food supply and are unsafe for human or animal consumption. People are also concerned that genetically modified seeds create genetic pollution in the environment and will have unforeseen effects on the ecosphere. Everything we eat is genetically modified from its wild ancestors, but if this was done a few thousand years ago, people are less concerned than if it was done in a lab yesterday. Humans started working and developing agriculture about 10,000 years ago. People have hybridized plants to make new crops, and uh, they were uh, eventually able to recognize that you could make crosses of different strains within the same species. Uh, more recently, of course, is the genetic engineering process. You can identify a unique gene, you can uh, re reconstruct that gene, and you can introduce it into a host plant. All we are doing is is a, the next level of plant breeding. We're giving it a very specific trait by moving something across. It's very precise. You're taking out of an entire library a single couple of sentences and moving it into an organism. No one has a clue about risk, right? Our intuitions do not equip us for a an objective understanding of what really matters in terms of risk. People avoid GMOs because they think they're carcinogenic, despite there's no, in fact, there's no evidence for that. And everyone's busily, you know, pouring alcohol down their throats, which is a proven carcinogen. Uh, one general fear that people have is that somehow th these products are not safe, that they haven't been adequately tested. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. These, have been, these plants have undergone very thorough, confined field testing to make sure that there are no safety issues, no environmental issues with them whatsoever. There is a series of steps that the regulators impose on researchers before you can come to a, a product that's commercialized. This takes years, though there is very, very sophisticated and detailed testing. Uh, there is no concern about safety of these plants. There have been literally thousands of research publications supporting uh, the, the fact that these products are indeed very safe. Thus far, the main use of GM technology has been to create seeds that are resistant to specific brands of herbicides. Activists allege that global megacorporations are using this technology just to sell more chemicals and are creating seed monopolies, encouraging monoculture, and are contributing to the evolution of superweeds that are pesticide resistant. In, in the case of, of, um, of glyphosate resistance, what the researchers found back in 1975, uh, that there was a particular kind of soil bacterium uh, which was resistant to uh, glyphosate, and they managed to take the, the gene from that bacterium that rendered it resistant and implanted it into the genome of, uh, of canola. And using the canola example for herbicide tolerance, if you take the seeds of that plant and uh, extract the oil and, and bottle it for vegetable oil, you cannot tell the difference from that oil uh, in that bottle from one that has been produced 
from organic canola or conventional canola. So there's been no engineering of the oil, which is another misunderstanding. You know, in the UK, there's no GMOs, and we've already got 50 herbicide-resistant superweeds, so-called. Except no one calls them superweeds because they don't exist with GMOs. But the point is, um, you will never beat evolution. And using any kind of crop protection, uh, whether it's the pesticide or the pest-resistant crop, puts a selective pressure in the environment for those pests to re evolve resistance. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't use the technology in a sensible way to try and forestall resistance for as long as possible. It's like saying we shouldn't use antibiotics because of antibiotic resistance. So therefore, everyone needs to go back to dying of pneumonia and other preventable diseases. Now that's dumb, but it's just as dumb to say that in agriculture. In spite of the concerns about genetically modified foods, why are farmers so confident that GM technology is not only safe, but that consumers and environmentalists should be actively supporting GM technology? Golden rice is an excellent example of a GM crop that has direct human health benefits. Of course, rice is generally consumed as a white rice, and it's consumed that way in many parts of the world, including the tropics. Many of these people are very short of vitamin A, and this results in very serious health problems such as night blindness. It really is the cause of terrible diseases and many deaths. And golden rice has been developed through GM technology, and it's been demonstrated uh, that you could consume that rice and you could receive enough vitamin A. Unfortunately, that rice has not been released commercially, even though it has been developed about 12 years ago for commercial release, simply because of the fear-mongering and the activist concerns. It's really a tragedy. But everything else remaining equal, if you can get a seed which gives you a better harvest in a dry year, then you've got to be better off. And that's the situation for a lot of farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. This is what we have with genetic modification. The potential is there, it's tremendous. We have the possibility of, of crops that require less water. We have the possibility of taking specific genes from broccoli, let's say, health promoting substances and putting into potatoes. I mean, all of these things are, are possible, but we're at the forefront of this technology. So it would be crazy to cut it off. Insect resistant crops, which have been bred using biotechnology, and BT is a great example allow farmers to reduce their use of insecticide. Now that's a good thing for sustainable agriculture because you have less chemical pollution on the land. I don't see any reason why using modern genetics in crop breeding should be rejected. It's, it's illogical and in fact, ultimately, it's counterproductive for the environmental objectives that we all share. All we can say is that based on the scientific knowledge that we have today, the benefits greatly outweigh the risks. And added to that is the fact that we have a lot of scientific knowledge. We're not just guessing. So there's no credible evidence at all that anybody has ever been harmed by consuming genetically modified foods. I am worried about the pesticides in our food. Um, I'm worried as well that even if you buy organic, it doesn't really mean organic because I think that pesticide use is so widespread that you're getting food that's affected by pesticides even when you try to buy organic. The second concern is the use of chemicals in modern agriculture. There is a meme that farmers irresponsibly soak their fields in pesticides to maximize profits. Activists say that harmful chemicals build up in the soil, get into the food supply, and are causing a spike in cancer rates and other diseases. Most people, when they see that sprayer passing, they think, oh my goodness, look at all the material coming out of that, that spray boom and those nozzles, and look at all the mist that's being created. Well, the vast majority of what they see is water. In fact, 99% on average is water that's coming out. And the actual amount of active ingredient that's present is very small. It's a few cups. It's even a few tablespoons, in many cases, per football field. Uh, just because something is dangerous in a high dose doesn't mean that it's a problem in a small dose. Uh, aspirin is a, is a classic example. I mean, aspirin is a, is a great headache remedy, but you have to know how much to take. If you take an aspirin tablet when you have a headache and you lick it, your headache is not going to go away. If you swallow two tablets, the headache will go away. If you swallow a whole bottle of tablets, you will go away. We wouldn't use a chemical product on our crop if it didn't need it. We use those products to address a very specific concern. It may, may be a disease concern, it may be an insect concern, 
but rest assured the products that we're using are specific and necessary for the viability and health of that plant. Pesticides are a revolutionary technology in agriculture. They're incredibly uh, targeted in what they do. So they don't inhibit mechanisms in plants that simply don't occur in insects or fish or humans. They don't have a place to go in the, in the human body. So that's a real powerful uh, basis for their, their safety. Uh, the PMRA, for example, uses sophisticated models to determine the exposure of someone to the product they know the level that is safe, 100% safe for that individual, and then they will impose an additional safety factor. They'll, for example, say, no, we want it to be 100 times less than that to make sure that the vulnerable are also protected. This is why we have regulatory agencies, you know, who are not manned by uncaring people. Uh, they're good scientists, uh, they do good work, and uh, their job is really to protect the public, not to undermine public health. Uh, so, I mean, anyone who avoids eating fruits and vegetables or grains because they're worried about the pesticide residues is doing themselves a disservice. It comes down to risk benefits, the benefits uh, of all the, the nutritional components of, of plant foods outweigh any of the risks that may be there because of pesticide residues or, or anything to do with genetic modification. Just because someone is a conventional farmer doesn't mean they're not also an environmentalist. It doesn't mean that a farmer doesn't also worry about the safety of the food that they feed their family. The other thing to think about is that farmers are the people who are actually using these things. So they're the ones who are the most concerned about spraying something too close to their house or too close to, to their school or that they're actually the ones who are pouring it into tanks. So if they had any concern whatsoever that some of these products were unsafe to use or unsafe for the environment, they would be the first ones affected and the first ones to make sure that they weren't used. The old insecticides are like your family car from 1965. It had a big V8, it got a whopping 10 miles per gallon. The new car is a Tesla. It's electric. It doesn't pollute. Sometimes Teslas catch fire. We've seen those. Ban all electric cars forever. Is that the answer to that problem? According to the experts we interviewed, there is a surprising twist in this story. Farmers look to the cutting edge of chemical technology to protect the environment and make sure our farms are sustainable for generations to come. Uh, there's a good news story out there that very few people appreciate. The use of these technologies has allowed farmers here to go to continuous cropping, which is a phenomenal development. We're not dealing with those terrible dust storms we used to have when we had to summer fallow because we couldn't use continuous cropping methods. These methods of production ha have actually restored millions of tons of carbon into the soil. In other words, we've contributed to uh, the, the problems of climate change by capturing carbon dioxide. I, I feel very positive about the sustainability of our agricultural systems using these new technologies. The third concern held by consumers is that the romantic ideal of farming is gone, replaced by industrial food operations that grow inferior food, less satisfying and less nutritious. Many people also believe that farmers are forced to buy seeds from certain companies, are virtual slaves to unfair policies, and are no longer in control of their land or the crops they grow. But does this perception match the reality? A lot of people want their lives to change, but they don't want farmers' lives to change. So a lot of people would be really, really insulted if you told them they had to put away their iPhone and they had to go back to a, to a phone that you actually turned the crank on in order to get three rings. So their idea is, though, that, that farmers will continue to use the technology that was around when the phone was a crank phone. It's confusing when we hear about corporate farms versus family farms. And the truth is that 97% of the farms in Canada are still family owned and operated. And that includes ours, regardless of the fact that it's larger in size. That's become a reality of our, of our business. Most consumers believe that 
Farmers are forced to use specific GMO seed and specific pesticides from big companies, but that's not true at all. Uh, in fact, farmers make those decisions because it's what's best for growing those crops most efficiently. Um, it actually lets them to produce more food on the same amount of land. The efficiency with which you use land is a really important environmental metric. If you can get the maximum yield from the smallest area of land, then you can spare a much larger area for the rainforest and for wetlands and for other areas of habitat which are really important for natural species. If, on the other hand, the whole world has to go organic and go back to using you know, old technologies from the 1950s, then we'd have to double the area of land which we're ploughing up, which would mean destroying the rainforest and so on. And nobody gets this, right? Everyone thinks that organic is better for the environment, but because it's less productive, because by definition it uses more land, that's actually a much worse issue if you're concerned about biodiversity and conservation. If, if science can continue to be a part of seed development, Farmers are going to have more opportunity to grow the food that we need with potentially the use of less pesticides, with better disease prevention, some drought tolerance. The, the seed varieties that have science behind them allow us to better manage our risk in the field. You know, Mother Nature is really the one that controls the weather. The farmers are the ones that have to do the best job we can to grow a healthy plant given the environment that we're in. The scientific consensus about food safety is not new, and farmers have always used the most cutting-edge technology available. Canada's own regulatory agencies and the farmers themselves know that the food we grow and the way we grow it is safe. And yet, in the public sphere, a passionate debate continues, a debate that seems to have less to do with science and more to do with a battle for public perception. Certainly one organization can make a difference, but if we work with others, we'll have a bigger impact. So we've been working with partners such as agriculture in the classroom so that people understand what agriculture is. SAS Canola is also looking at doing work with dietitians, culinary schools, people like that, so they can understand that the food that they're cooking with and they're providing people is safe and actually has some real healthy um, attributes. The reason that negative agricultural information or myths about food get more traction than positive information or scientific information is very much the same reason that murder makes page one of the newspaper. There are very few emotions that, that humans have that really make us want to act and fear, that's one of them. It's easy to, to develop this fear that somehow you've mixed large amounts of genetic information and you've created something totally different. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. People have always been suspicious of new technologies and new innovations. Um, I've heard it said that the French opposed the refrigeration of meat because they worried it would contaminate it. And people also think that natural things are less risky, um, which is completely illogical. Relatively, until recent times, until 70, 80 years ago, 70% of the population was somehow involved in farming. Today, it's less than 2%. 2% of the population is providing the fantastic amount of food that, that we enjoy. Well, that obviously had to come about with, with some innovations in technology. And then, there are, of course, there is the romanticized idea that they, they, a small farm somehow produces better quality food than what is possible to do on, on quote, industrial farms today. It's, it's called a naturalistic fallacy. And that's one of the great myths of our time. So you can misinform a million people using YouTube um, much more quickly and much more easily than some expert can come back and tell them the truth. It's sometimes disappointing and a, a little bit painful to talk to people and have them talk about what I do with so little understanding of what I do. We want to take care of the land that we grow it on because this is the land that we've had for generations. I love farming and I love the way that we farm. Farmers are still credible voices. Big Ag is not a credible voice. The biotech company is not a credible voice. But the farmer who lives the life close to the land, producing off the land, understanding the systems they need, understanding the pressures that they have in the modern world, those are the people who should be talking to the urban foodies who misunderstand modern agriculture, not the biotech companies. 
it's the farmers who've got to come out and defend what they're doing and, and convince people that they're trying to do the best. They're trying to produce healthy food, they're trying to protect the soils, they're trying to um, improve the environment. And if farmers don't come out and say this, then somebody is going to step into that void. I hear about the stories and I, and I think about the misconceptions. It's an overwhelming task to imagine how can we educate every consumer in Canada? How can we educate consumers around the globe about this industry? And, and why do I think that my industry is so important for everybody to hear about? I really want to let producers know that they're trusted. The public trusts them and they need to stand up. They need to get out there and tell their story. And they might think, hey, no one wants to hear what I have to say, but people do want to hear what you have to say. And if you don't tell the story, somebody else is gonna. <laughs> I'm a farmer from Moss Bank, Saskatchewan. I'm also a mother of two farm girls and I've recently been hired by Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan to facilitate training sessions around the province to encourage other farmers to speak up and talk about the modern agricultural practices we use today to grow food for other Canadians. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because actually the reality is that 97 percent of the farms in Canada are family owned and operated. One of the things I found that worked the best was to start asking them questions. Did you realize I use less diesel fuel? No, I didn't. I was so unprepared that I didn't have any answers for it. And I wish I was more informed then. You just have to be confident, and that's part of what this is trying to do, is build your confidence. I wanted to get out, and I didn't want to sit at home and complain about things. I wanted to see if I could actually make some improvements. We've learned how to engage consumers to tell them what we do as farmers, that we're proud of what we do, that we produce safe food. If I had to go back and farm the way we did 30 years ago, I wouldn't farm. I know that. I'm not into recreational tillage and the harm that that does for our environment. I'm about trying to make the land better, improving its organic matter and its tilth. Because of these advancements, I'm still interested in willing to farm. One of the things that, that I find rewarding is to see that uh, aha moment in people's eyes. Maybe they were confused or upset even. You've uh, given them understanding of the way we produce food and how it's safe. That's what I really enjoy. I'm proud to be a farmer and, and contribute to growing safe, quality, healthy products try to make a positive impact on the world and practice good stewardship and we will eat what we grow and we're proud to do it. I love what I do. I have, I have no uh, 63 years old with no retirement plans whatsoever. Uh, they'll drag me out in the box probably. Doyle Wade with Farm at Langham. I'm the third generation in the community of our family. What I'm beginning to understand is that Canadians trust farmers. They actually want to hear from you. They're, they're less concerned about the studies and the science. They're really just interested in why it is I care so much about the food that I grow on my farm operation. And that's given me the motivation to say, yeah, I can participate in this conversation as a farmer. With every sort of added regulation or policy that gets put into place um, based on consumer concerns as opposed to scientific concerns, the ways and means that farmers produce food uh, could very much be under threat. If farmers don't stand up and speak out and become their own advocates and tell their own stories, this trend of other people telling their stories for them is going to continue and it's going to grow exponentially. If farmers don't take the opportunity to speak up about the decisions that we want to make. My fear is that we will lose that privilege. Generations of farmers have struggled and prospered here, but the landscape has changed and their biggest challenge yet still remains. Standing up to dispel the myths about modern agriculture. Will Canadian farmers make themselves heard before it's too late? Or will they stay silent and lose their license to farm.